Apple, two underscores, Ant Pro, two underscores, A N T in tonight's episode of Disguise Coverage. We are going to dive into one of the most important and also underrated players, not just on the Buffalo Bills defense, but I think on the Buffalo Bills as a whole, slot corner Taron Johnson, someone who, you know, I'll kind of walk you guys through the, the process of how this episode came to be. Over the last several weeks, I've just been, I mean, I've been watching a ton of film from the 2021 season, um, this entire offseason, especially these last several weeks. And as I kept watching for other players on defense, Taron Johnson just kept flashing, much as he did during the season. And I had an appreciation for him then. But as this season, as this offseason has gone, the combination of reviewing the 2021 tape combined with looking and seeing at where NFL defenses are now, not just the Buffalo Bills defense. Obviously, you know, that's what we're going to dive into and talk about tonight in relation to Taron Johnson, but where defenses are as a whole in today's NFL. What is being asked of coverage players, both at the second and third level? What is being asked of them in terms of role, responsibility, demands, mentally, physically, emotionally, everything? Taron Johnson encapsulates that demand because his role and all of those demands are turned up a little bit on the dial because of what is asked of him in this Buffalo Bills defense because of how demanding his role is in general in today's NFL, but especially in the Buffalo Bills defense. And so I've been, you know, studying a lot of scheme and trends and a whole bunch of things from a league wide perspective. And then obviously from a Bills perspective as well. And so just going back and watching the tape, I just kept coming away more and more impressed with Taron Johnson as I was lining up the content schedule for this off season, leading into training camp. This episode wasn't, you know, planned, but as I, I made my way through the week last week, um, you know, and also doing that episode last week with Kendall ranking, ranking the position groupings on the Bills defense, I dove into Taron Johnson a little bit, and then I was saying, you know what, Taron Johnson needs a full episode so people can kind of appreciate just how good he is, and not only how good he is, but how important his role is, and how important it is at which the level at the level at which he plays that position. Cause that's not just it, right? Not only is his position hard and tremendously demanding, he plays that position at a very high level. He executes at a very high level. And you know, there's a lot of good players on this bills team offensively and defensively, but I think at times he gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. So we're going to shine a little bit of a spotlight tonight on Taron Johnson. Talk about that slot corner position in today's NFL, why it's so important in general, why it's so important to the Buffalo Bills, how Taron Johnson plays it, how well he does in a variety of ways. We're going to talk about some film. We're going to talk about some metrics, tie it all together, and paint a beautiful picture. Speaking of beautiful, you know I always appreciate the appreciation of the tree. And anyway, you know, I got, we got another one. Jason comes in and says, cool colors on the tree. Appreciate you. Told you we're going to change up the garland. Also got a little uh, red, white, and blue, you know, Snoopy action over there. Cause you know, America's birthday month, all that jazz. But I think, yeah, the tree looks good. It's popping. The, I think the garland combined with the silver tree combined with the white lights. Yeah. It's a good look over there. And you know, dad of a Bills fan, you criticized the tree last week, but I appreciate you coming back and showing some love now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Daniel's here saying what up and also saying go Bills. Appreciate you guys and girls always joining it. See, Daniel, you get it too. Respect to the tree. Everybody's got to give respect to the tree. I said it last week. This show is really just a medium and an excuse for me to be able to showcase the tree every week. The content, the football talk, the X's and O's, the how's and the why's, it's all secondary. That's the number one priority. Well, I'm bad in pointing. There we go. That's the number one priority right there, the tree. That's what all this is about. That's what all this has ever been about. It's all been leading to appreciation of the tree. For those of you joining me live as we start to pile in here on this episode, you guys know what we like to do here on Disguise Coverage. Any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, philosophies, ideologies, maxims, whatever have you, throw it up into the chat. I love seeing the engagement between everyone in the chat. I love the questions, comments, and thoughts that come my way. Um, you know, I always make it a priority to try and answer literally any and every single question, comment, thought, or concern, whatever have you that comes through into the live chat. So, you know, throw whatever you got up into the chat at any point. We'll, we'll try and address every single piece of it. As you guys also know, super chats get priority 
not just because I respect the donation and because it's a rule of the show, but also because, you know, as I'm reading notes as my split screen here, um, but when I see the super chat, I see the color, it attracts my eyes and immediately, you know, kind of change, changes perspective and viewpoints for me. Oh, Jason with a thought here, the tree needs its own show. I don't know if the tree, the tree's a little camera shy. I don't know if the tree wants to be in the foreground like that. Um, I also don't know how well the tree would be able to handle the chat. Um, I don't know if the tree's comfortable, you know, speaking on camera. Obviously, the tree's comfortable, like, visually being on camera. But speaking on camera, I don't know. You know, we'll see what the tree could do. You know, but it, the tree is so beautiful. Maybe if I just moved it up and put it front and center right here and just let the camera run in silence for about an hour, that could be something because the tree is beautiful. I appreciate where your head's at, Jason. So, yes, any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, whatever you got, throw them up into the chat so we can engage here on this live episode of Disguise Coverage. While you are here stopping in live, please drop a like on this video. If you are watching later, that's fine too. Drop a like on this video even when you're watching later. If you are listening on any one of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review on any and every of those podcasting apps and or platforms. Please subscribe to Disguise Coverage on YouTube or any one of the podcasting apps or platforms. Subscribe to Disguise Coverage and to Cover One. You guys know that Cover One has you covered literally every single day of the week when it comes to anything and everything Buffalo Bills. And then we also have a variety of shows breaking down just holistic football and the X's and O's and everything. You know, we are your one-stop shop for football knowledge and that deserves a subscription at times. Ooh, Jessica with a comment. I thought it was about Snoopy. It could be about Snoopy a little bit. I like Snoopy. He's pretty sweet, but the tree is sweet. Ooh, good comment here from Daniel. The tree is best suited in a support role, stoic and silent in the background. I like that. The tree is, ooh, the tree is very stoic. Evening Matthew. Matthew coming in saying, evening Bills fam, go Bills, and that he believes. Matthew was also a big supporter of last night's film room episode where in case you folks haven't heard or haven't noticed myself, Eric Turner and Mr. Kendall Mursky were joined by Buffalo Bills starting center, Mitch Morse last night in the cover one film room. So after this episode of disguise coverage, if you haven't checked that episode out of the film room, finish this episode of disguise coverage, go get yourself some cover one film room while we sit down and talk X's and O's and talk football processing, uh, scheme technique, just really just sitting down talking ball with Mitch Morris, who's one of the best centers in the entire league and breaking down some film and doing a whole bunch of stuff. So that episode of the film was awesome. Matthew uh, was there last night. So, you know, very good stuff, very good stuff from everyone. And appreciate everybody. As we start to see, I start to see more people come in. I start to see the chat go little by little, drop a like while you guys are coming in here and while you girls are coming in here too, making everything as inclusive as possible. Coming here from Jason saying, interested to hear how you may compare Johnson to other slot corners in the league. We are going to talk about that for a bit tonight because there are – actually, I can talk about it a little bit now. I, slot corner is still – is really any position in the NFL is, despite the fact that there are so many similarities amongst teams, offensively and defensively and scheme-related. But slot corner, again, like a lot of positions in the NFL, if not all of them, it really is kind of pick your flavor based on what type of scheme you are running defensively. There's a lot of top slot corner options, you know, whether you want to rank them one through three, one through five, number one, whoever, you know, and, and wherever, you know, you've got Taron Johnson, you've got Mike Hilton, you've got Kenny Moore. Um, you've got Gardner Johnson in New Orleans. You've got even, if you want to count Jalen Ramsey with how much he kicks into the slot in that star role for the Rams defense, there are, you know, and, and there's more as well. There's a variety of guys who function in that world. And each team asks different things of them based on the type of scheme they play on defense, both in a coverage perspective and in a run fit perspective. Um, I think Taron Johnson's right up there, honestly. I think you can make a case. Again, it's always kind of pick your flavor. So I think you just want somebody to be in that Rolodex. I think it's hard to sit and just objectively be like, same thing for any position. Um but especially at slot corner and corner in general, both the, with the outside corners as well, it's hard for me at least to objectively sit there and be like, this guy's the best corner because scheme plays into it so much. What is asked of them? How are they being used? What other supporting cast do they have around them? But I think Taron Johnson is definitely in that Rolodex of best slot corner in the league. I think he is right up there with the Kenny Moores and the Mike Hiltons of the world. And again, if it depends on what you're looking for, you know, you might think, you know, Gardner Johnson down in New Orleans is the best. You might think Mike Hilton's the best. Some people like Kenny Moore. Some people think it's Taron Johnson. Jalen Ramsey, again, skews that a little bit. Um, 
because he plays inside, you know, a significant amount over 240 snaps in the slot last year. So I think it depends on where you're looking and what you're looking for when you're trying to compare slot corners. But for me, he's in that Rolodex. And a lot of it is because of what is asked of him and how he performs in that role, given what is asked of him in that Buffalo Bills defense, which we're going to, which we're going to dive into tonight. But good question, Jason, and good thought. Ralph Wilson Sr. saying, nice coverage of Ant's uh, modem being disguised as a tree. No, there's no there's no modem. Oh, you might see if you see a cord. No, uh, there's it's just like an electrical outlet behind the tree, and then that's where the tree is plugged in. No modem, but but uh, oh, awesome comment from Matthew. You were saying great episode talking about the film room last night, saying and thanks to Mitch for his time. Epic interview. Yeah, Mitch Morse was super gracious. He just got back from vacation um, over the weekend with the family, and took it was his first day back. He took time to sit down with us, and he was. So detailed, you know, we sat for, you know, 50 minutes for the episode and even beforehand, just chopping it up and going over things and for him to sit down and give, you know, the level of detail that he did in answering our questions and breaking down film and how candid he was with his answers and just how forthcoming and also just kind of like a good dude. Like he just, if he wasn't in the NFL or even with him being in the NFL, like I feel like you could just sit down and just hang out with Mitch Morris for like hours. He was just a really great guy. Um, So it was cool to know that you know, we were able to sit down with somebody who really is one of the best players at his position in the league. And then he was also a really good dude on top of it. So yeah, it was an, uh, it was an awesome time. Ooh, Vito says, are we meeting at training camp? Vito, if you're going to be there Sunday, July 24th, we a thousand percent can meet at training camp myself and the majority of the cover one crew will be there at Bill's training camp at St. John Fisher. I'll only be there Sunday. Monday, I will be back in Buffalo uh, for some things I have to take care of during the day. And then for the Rage Against the Machine Run the Jewels concert um, that Monday night. So I will only be there for Sunday, July 24th. But whew, hit me in the DMs. We would like to meet up with as many people as possible, whether members of the Slack channel, whether just followers on Twitter, watchers of the shows, whatever have you. Uh, you know, give me a follow on Twitter. If you don't already, Vito, I know you do. Um, hit me up in the DMs. We'll try and get up and, and anything and everything that we can do. Yeah, Daniel coming through and saying Mitch Morse was great. Very insightful and personable. 1,000%. He was awesome um, last night. Ooh, Matthew again saying stoked for St. John Fisher. Troy coming through with some more kind words for Mitch. Yeah, Mitch Morse again, super personable, funny, down-to-earth guy, but also tremendously smart, tremendously heady. Um gave us a lot of insight in terms of how he approaches the game, how he likes to play the game, what he looks for in terms of like reading plays and, you know, adjusting on the fly, but also pre-snap preparation for the week, you know, in addition to the post-snap and all the pieces. So yeah, tremendously insightful. Um, and also, yeah, just a really good dude who was, it was just fun to hang out with him, let alone the level of insight that he offered um, up for, for the entire episode. It was absolutely tremendous. So go check out that episode of the cover one film room last night, Steven joining in saying that it was a great interview. It was 1000% Steven. You're spot on. You know what else is spot on the sponsor of this show? One pie pizza. The online menu can be found in the episode show notes, whether you are watching on YouTube or listening on any one of the podcasting apps or platforms, go get yourself some one pie pizza. It is hands down the best pizza in all of Buffalo. Delicious sweet sauce pie, fantastic cheese to sauce ratio, cup of charred pepperoni. They make their own homemade blue cheese. They do drives and initiatives for the community and just for, for people um, regularly. Again, I mention it all the time, but I like I like to continue to you know bang that drum a little bit just because I think it's tremendous what they do in you know partnering with Roswell to try and knock out cancer, what they do with the SPCA, what they've done uh, you know in extending proceeds towards the Alzheimer's Foundation and just Anything and everything they do, they are great people making great food. And not even again, not just pizza, like everything they sell there is delicious. I say it all the time. I don't like potato salad. I like their potato salad because just everything they make is fantastic. So go get yourself some one pie pizza. Treat yourself to some one pie pizza and do some good for the community and for humanity at large. You know, get yourself some one pie pizza. And that may sound a little corny or dramatic, but it's not. They're really good people making really good pizza. Go get yourself some one pie pizza. I would not have partnered with them if they weren't absolutely top notch. Oh, Steven says, hey, Ant, when are you going to get PowerPoint on? You know, uh, Mr. Jordan PowerPoint Poyer would be an awesome guest. Maybe, maybe that could be something that happens in the future. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Maybe, maybe. Oh, 
Appreciate you, Matthew, saying, and by the way, big props to you and everyone at Cover One. We appreciate your support greatly. Um, again, we wouldn't be able to, to do any of the things that we do without the support um, that we receive from everyone in whatever form or fashion it comes in. So thank you very much, Matthew. Appreciate you. Let's dive into this episode fully now as we've done this little intro and opening thoughts as we like to do. That's kind of become like the unofficial official form of this show kind of intro the episode. And then as people come through questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, start to answer everything to kind of, you know, get the juices flowing a little bit. And then we dive into the topic. I didn't plan that for how like the outline or like flow of this show would go, but over the last like really two, three months, I feel like that's kind of been, you know, the rhythm that's been established. So I like it. And now again, the new banners up, you see it at the bottom. If you're not watching, you don't see it at the bottom, but I'll tell you what it says. It says slot corner as a premium position in today's NFL. And that's where we're going to lead. You know, before we dive into Taron Johnson specifics, there's some in here, but I really wanted to highlight the importance of slot corner in today's NFL because I truly believe it. if it's not in that tier of premium position, it's in that next tier that's right on the cusp of tier one premium position. And in case anyone doesn't know, for a long time, the premium positions in the NFL were – you know, edge rusher, you know, getting sacks, pressure on the quarterback. And, you know, if we take it even, you know, further back, a lot of it was based on being able to affect the quarterback from the blind side. So most quarterbacks are right-handed. So defenses, you know, wanted a right defensive end who could get to the quarterback from the quarterback's blind side. To counteract that, offenses wanted a premium left tackle. So that way that left tackle can protect the quarterback's blind side. So then you had edge rusher, and you had left tackle as those premium positions. Right tackle has kind of crept up as a premium position now because defensive ends are so fluid and adept at rushing from both sides of the field. And then corner is in there as a premium position. Again, all these positions that are related around either supporting the quarterback or hindering and or attacking the quarterback. So the edge rushers, tackle, corner. And then, you know, maybe different teams have different roles for certain positions, so those creep up in terms of importance. But when you're looking in today's NFL, slot corner is right up there. Before 80s, even before 70s, 80s, but then through the 90s and the 2000s, even throughout like the 2010s and that, a lot of teams were still rolling with three linebackers as their base defense. You had your middle linebacker, and then you had your Will, you had your Sam. If you were just a 4-3 defense, if you were a 3-4 defense, then you had your two outside linebackers that were functioning as edge rushers, but who could also drop. And then you had two middle linebackers and that's how a lot of teams function. And if you brought in a nickel corner, you know, that's what it was called. Like it was called a nickel corner because that's the fifth defensive back on the field. You bring out one of your linebackers, you put that corner in. He wasn't really known. It was, you know, it was a slot corner because that's what the position was, but it was more known as that nickel corner or a nickel back like the band because, that meant you were in nickel and it was a sub package. It wasn't something that teams used regularly. It wasn't their base defense. It was used on third down or it was used in passing situations or it was used against teams that were more pass heavy. And maybe, maybe it was more of a game plan specific package for an individual week. Now what you're starting to see and really over the last several years, the majority of teams are in nickel the heavy majority of the time. We'll use the Bills as an example. In 2020, this is wild, the Bills were in nickel 91% of the time, which led the NFL in 2020. They were in nickel 91% of the time. In 2021, they were in nickel 90.8% of the time. And that's total, you know, in 2021, that 90.8 is total for run snaps and pass snaps. And that includes the playoffs. So, In 2021, including the playoffs, the Bills had 611 total pass defense snaps. They were in nickel 578 out of that 611. They had 489 uh, total run defense snaps in 2021. 421 of those were played in nickel. So 489 run snaps, 421 in nickel, 611 pass defense snaps, 578 in nickel. And those, again, those 421 run snaps played in nickel was the most in the NFL. So keep that in mind, right? When we're talking about what Taron Johnson does, those, all those run snaps in nickel, those run defense snaps as nickel means Taron Johnson has to fit the run and play like a linebacker at times, which we're going to get into. That's just a little preview, a little foreshadowing. The Bills are in nickel defense a lot. And they're in the tops of the league again. They led it in 2020 and tops again in 2021. 
but that's not unique to them. The majority of teams have nickel personnel as their number one defensive package. Nickel is base is the type of verbiage that's used now. And for the teams that don't have nickel as their most used personnel package, a lot of them use dime packages, which means you have six defensive backs on the field. So whether you're looking at five, whether you're looking at six, either way, that means your slot corner is usually not leaving the field, knock on wood, unless they get hurt, unless something bad happens to them. I mentioned this on Twitter a couple weeks ago. I mentioned this in the uh, ranking the positional groups for the Bills episode last week. The fact that the Rams take Jalen Ramsey, who already plays a premium position, Jalen Ramsey – Outside corner, one of the best in the league, one of the best defensive players in the NFL, one of the best corners in the league. He plays a premium position. They take him from that premium position and flex him into a slot corner role at different times because of the importance of that position. They are taking somebody who already plays a tremendously important position and who plays it tremendously well, and they're kicking him inside as a slot corner because of the importance of that position, because of what is asked of that position. And a lot of it, again, comes from what you're asked to do. So I pulled some quotes from uh, Matt Bowen, former NFL safety, who is a tremendous follow on Twitter, does uh, the NFL matchup stuff on ESPN, writes for ESPN, also coaches um, defensive backs at the high school level. And he talks about, you know, what it, the, the demand that is put on that position. And he talks about how your footwork, your hips, your change of direction speed, all that stuff needs to mesh to play inside because you have so much more area to cover. If you get beat on a crossing route in the NFL, you're not going to catch up. You're not. It's not going to happen. And if you think about that, if you're lined up in the slot, if you take one false step, if your hand placement is off, if your footwork is off, you, you can get beat so easily. And a lot of it is because you're, you're almost on an island. When, when you think about the outside corners, right? You think about the Tredavious Whites and the Levi Wallaces of the world, if you're thinking of it from a Bills perspective. Outside corners can utilize the sideline as leverage, and they have the ability to squeeze opponent um, opposing receivers into that sideline. You always hear that kind of, that, that phrase every once in a while of, you know, use the, use the sideline as an extra defender. Use that as your help. Slot corners, because they're in the slot, are playing more towards the center of the field, which means they have to rely more on play recognition, quickness, technique, processing ability in order to stick with receivers. And a lot of it is is stemming from having that two-way go. I spoke about it last week. Uh, I wanted to break it down just a little bit in this week in case people don't know. So a two-way go just means literally they have two ways they can go. They can go inside they can go outside. But because you're in that slot, you're more towards the center of the field. There's so much more space that you, that you're able to work with. So you have so much more to choose from as a receiver. There's so many more routes that are available to you. There's so many more types of releases that are available to you in the slot because you don't have that boundary. You don't have that sideline outside of you in conjunction with the corner in front of you, squeezing you down and kind of forcing you into a box a little bit. When you're in the slot, So much more is open to you, which is why you start to see teams nowadays are putting more of their primary receivers into the slot. You see what Cooper Cup does in the slot. Devontae Adams gets kicked inside to the slot. Tyreek Hill gets kicked inside to the slot. You see these dominant receivers who who have the body type and the skill sets a lot of times of you know, traditional like outside receivers, maybe not so much in the Tyreek Hill case because of his size, or maybe not Cooper Cup because of a long speed, but You've got guys who are primary number one receivers. They kick in to the slot. Or you've got teams who their primary number one receiver is that slot receiver. You have a lot of advantages as a receiver in the slot. You're not on the line of scrimmage. You, you're not, you don't have a defensive back always right in your face. You have a little more space and separation naturally before a corner can try and jam you. And then again, you have that two-way go. The, the slot corner in front of you as a slot wide receiver has to play you inside and outside. He can't just, you know, give you an outside shade and give you the inside because if you give away that inside, you give that free access and that slot receiver runs a deep over or a crossing route, it's hard to get back, to get that leverage and get back over top and catch up, not to mention you're going to have to run through your teammates or other receivers and you're running through garbage and traffic and trying to catch up. Even if you didn't have to sift through all the traffic in the middle of the field, it's still hard 
if you give someone that easy pathway. So you can't have it. A lot of times you have to line up head up on that slot receiver, or if you're giving them, you know, if you're shading them, you're a little slightly off center. You can't just try and take away one aspect and give them a free lane inside or outside because it's an easy way to get beat. And then you factor in the quarterback piece of everything, right? So if you just think about naturally as a quarterback, what's easier, (laughs) making throws to your slot receiver or throws to one of your receivers on the outside? The answer is your slot receivers. You, You have more timing and precision and accuracy and arm strength and all of those, you know, quarterback pieces all of those have to be dialed up a little more in order to complete outside, you know, the number of throws, those throws towards the sideline, those throws to your outside receivers. Whereas you've got those slot receivers. Those are usually your quick hitters, maybe even a check down option, more of a security blanket. And it's just basic, I don't know, spatial awareness or physics or whatever have you. Like it's easier to complete a pass to a slot guy. If he's only seven yards away from you, than it is competing, completing a pass to your X receiver on the outside when he's 12 or 13 yards away from you and he's got a corner on top of him and maybe he's got a linebacker underneath. Maybe he's got a safety underneath. Maybe he's got a a slot corner underneath. You have to put arc on the ball. You have to worry about your trajectory. In addition to your timing, accuracy, arm strength, all of that, it's much easier rather than throwing, you know, a 10 yard out to Stefan Diggs. It's much easier to throw a seven yard hitch route to Cole Beasley or a slant to your inside slot receiver. It's much easier to do that. And if you think about it from, this is a a great quote from Matt Bowen as well. He says, if you're a quarterback's coach, would you want your quarterback to be on the far hash and throw an out route? Or would you want him to throw a crossing route or a seam route right in front of him? You throw an out route that's not on time and it might be on the back shoulder against Jalen Ramsey. That's going back for a pick six. You got to be careful with that kind of stuff. And that's very true. If you're late on an inside route, maybe it gets picked off. You know, if you're late on a route to a slot receiver and your timing's off a little bit, maybe you dirt it, maybe it gets picked off, but you've got a high, you know, fidelity level when you're throwing to the outside there. There's so much more that's involved in order to complete that throw to the outside than it is. Again, it's just basic physics. It's easier to complete a seven yard pass than it is a 15 yard pass, let alone, and I'm talking 15, not from like vertically. Cause you think about it, if someone's running a 10 yard out, that's 10, right? And then they're going out. So you have to factor in the yardage from where the quarterback is throwing to that 10 yard out, right? So where's the quarterback standing? How far inside are they? How far outside is that receiver? A 10 yard out can be more like a 13, 14, 15 yard throw. And again, then you have to worry about trajectory and timing because who's underneath that route? What position is that outside corner in? Where's the slot corner? Is there a safety underneath? Are they playing in a sky or a buzz coverage underneath? Is the linebacker dropping underneath? Are they in zone? Are they in man? You know, all these types of things you have to read and react in the moment as a quarterback. Those things are easier the closer your receiving target is to you, which is why, man, like that slot receiver has become so important in today's NFL. You we've, we've seen Cole Beasley do it for years. It's a reason why, you know, he was Josh's security blanket in addition to, his high skill level and his rapport with Josh, a lot of it was just the functionality of the spacing. You know, he was able to read leverage and coverage right in front of him and just get off the ball fast and realize it's zone. Okay, cool. Let me sit. And then Josh has a cannon. So Josh can just complete a little seven yard pass in the absolute blink of an eye. Boom. You're good to go. You don't have to worry about multiple defenders underneath. You don't have to worry about trajectory on an over route like that you know, on, on underneath or a quick hitch or a quick slant. You don't have to worry about so many things like you do completing a pass to the outside. And then also factored in why this is a premium position as we continue to go. So we've talked about already that what, what's required of you as a slot corner in terms of what you're responsible for and what you have to defend. We've also talked about how it's easier for a QB to complete a pass to a slot receiver to things closer, you know, to the line of scrimmage closer to where he's got the ball and throwing from. And then also another piece that's, that's asked of them is that tackling piece and that functionality. Another again, quote from Matt Bowen, who's tremendous. If they throw the ball outside on a swing route to the running back, or they toss a bubble screen outside, that's you. You've got to make the tackle in space. 
So if that slot corner is too easily blocked or unreliable as a tackler, offenses will target him. Conversely, a slot corner who can play the run but can't be trusted to cover everyone on the opposing offense is essentially is essentially just playing a linebacker role. NFL teams, in other words, need playmakers at that position who can do it all. I'm going to take a drink of water. I love that quote because so much is asked of you. You have to function in space against a variety of things. It's not just about covering things going downfield. It's not just about, okay, it's my guy running and out. Is he running a post? Is he running a, is he running a hitch? You know, am I in zone? Am I in man? It's also about what's going on in front of you. Does that running back leak out? And then again, usually, you know, those check down guys, the running back, the tight end, you're probably going to be outsized. Taron Johnson is one of the quote unquote kind of like bigger or thicker, you know, more mass type of slot corners in the league. He's 5'11", 192 pounds. A lot of slot corners are in that 5'9 to 5'10, maybe 5'11 range, but they're more like 175 to 185. If you get a 190 pound slot corner, that's a big slot corner. Or you get a slot corner with length, like Again, Gardner Johnson down in New Orleans, he's got that physicality, he's got that size, he's got that length. That's not normal for slot corners. It's also part of the reason why the Rams like to kick Jalen Ramsey inside because he's a bigger body dude. This is the dude who could have potentially played safety in the NFL. So you kick him inside, he gives you more chess piece capability because of his size. Taron Johnson is built in that mold as well. So again, you've got this role, right, where you are asked to cover in a variety of ways, and then also function against things coming in front of you and fu- and function in a tackling aspect and function against the run. And also a huge piece, again, why this, why slot corner is a premium position in today's NFL. Think of all the players who line up in the slot that slot corners have to cover. Cooper Cup, Chris Godwin, Tyler Boyd, Hunter Renfro, Tyreek Hill, Keenan Allen, Jalen Waddell, uh, the Cole Beasley's of the world, the Rondell Moore's, the Jamison Crowder's. Also think about the teams that kick their tight ends into the slot, like Miami with Mike Kosicki, like the Ravens do with Mark Andrews. All these, all these different skill sets, all these different body types that play in the slot in today's NFL. You have to be able to cover and match up against those guys in a variety of coverages. You can't be a liability, like Matt Bowen said. You can't be a liability in man or zone because they're going to attack you, they're going to target you, right? And then because you've got those that, those variety of skill sets and body types, you have to be able to have the speed to run with Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle. You need the technical ability to be able to stay one-on-one with Cooper Cup with his precise route running. You need the size and the physicality to be able to hang with Mark Andrews from the slot. All these skill sets and body types that are different that you are responsible for in a variety of forms of coverage. And then on top of that, you have to fit the run against those guys. If you're, if Mark Andrews is lined up in the slot, or again, we use Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup is one of the best blocking wide receivers in there. I would actually, I shouldn't even, I should remove that. He's one of the best blockers in the NFL, right? And he's a bigger body guy. He's got a bigger frame. He's physical. If you're not a physical slot corner and you don't have the tenacity and the physicality and the violence required to fit the run, that's an easy matchup. They're going to dig you out every single snap because they know, oh, cool. They want to be a nickel? Cool. Let's go into three wide receiver sets. Let's put our tight end or a bigger bodied, you know, wide receiver into that slot and just push that slot corner out every single day. Like Matt Bowen said, right? If a slot corner is too easily blocked or unreliable as a tackler, offenses will target him. Offenses now, just like defenses, defenses are able to pinpoint weaknesses in offenses. Offenses have been able to do that against defenses for years. Pinpoint and target and develop game plans. If you have a slot corner who's weak in man or weak in zone or weak against the run, offenses, that's blood in the water. They're attacking every single play. If you are a liability anywhere, you're an easy target for an offense to pick on. You're an easy target for an offense to attack. You're straight up, you're a vulnerability. This position is so demanding with what is asked of you mentally and physically. You Again, you have to have coverage ability in man and zone. You have to have a high football IQ. You have to have quick processing speed and also be accurate 
in your processing. Think, think about it from an RPO perspective, right? Those run pass options. The Bills use them a lot. Josh Allen's in shotgun. He gets the snap. You know, he's putting it in Devin Singletary's stomach, but he's reading a second or third level defender. And if that second or third level defender, whoever his read is, comes up, Josh Allen keeps it, throws it right where that spot was vacated. If that second or third level defender stays back, he hands it off to Devin Singletary. A lot of times that second or third level defender is going to be or can be that slot corner. So you are the guy that QBs are reading and to decide whether or not they're going to run or pass in an RPO, run pass option. You are literally the player offenses are putting in conflict. You are the player they're attacking. And that's just one piece. That's just RPOs, let alone anything else. If you're deficient in an area and a team wants to attack you and game plan around you. So again, you need coverage ability in man and zone. You need a high football IQ. You need quick processing speed, and you need to be accurate in your processing. You need to be able to diagnose, run, or pass, and then fire that gun, have that quick trigger, click and close on whatever you're doing, especially if you're coming forward. You need to be able to tackle. You need physicality. You need tenacity. And think about, again, just what it takes to process the run, because as that slot corner Because so much is asked of you against the pass, you're almost in a state of, even if you're very good, you're you're in a state of vulnerability. You're kind of on an island. You have that two-way go like we talked about. You've got all the, the multitude of release options and route options and stem options for whoever you're covering. Then you've got all the body types and skill sets on top of it. So you have to read and react and adjust how you're going to play based on who's lined up in front of you, knowing the advantages they already have because of where they're aligned because of that two way go. And then you have to read and react what's going on in front of you. So think about it from a run perspective, right? Think about it from Taron Johnson's perspective to tie into this slot corner as a premium position. And this isn't holistically unique to Taron Johnson. This next part I'm going to talk about, but it's essential to why he's so good in that slot and why he's so important to this Buffalo Bills defense. Again, the Bills were in nickel in 2021, 91% of the time. Last year, 90.8% of the time. So for teams like the Bills that are playing nickel like that, if someone's running the ball, you're functioning as a linebacker. You are that third linebacker. That third linebacker has been subbed out, and your base package is now a five defensive back nickel package, which is awesome. For coverage, it's awesome for handling four wide receiver sets and three wide receiver sets. It's fantastic. That's the reason, you know, it's become so popular. But when teams do run the ball, you have to function in the run. And you need what it takes to properly process the run to see and diagnose. And again, have that processing speed. You need to be able to read it it quickly, but you also need to be able to read it accurately. You can't read run and then it's a pass. You can't read pass and then it's a run because you have to come up. And make a play. And then on top of that, you think about the tenacity piece, that physicality piece. How many times have you seen Taron Johnson make a play at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage? He's 5'11", 192 pounds. He comes up and fits the run like he's a linebacker. I mentioned on last week's show, he fits the run like when he sees himself in the mirror, he thinks he's A.J. Klein. Like he thinks he's, you know, 6'2", 230, 40 pounds. He comes through like a missile, whether it's the A gap, the B gap, the C gap, whether he has to take on alignment and fill and fit, whether he's a force player, whether he's spilling, whether he's folding in from the backside, whether he actually has to make that tackle. There's so much that's asked of Taron Johnson and any slot corner in today's NFL. So much is asked of you from a coverage perspective. And then again, on top of that, you have to fit the run. And you've got to tackle these stout, thick running backs. You have to take on linemen and tight ends around the line of scrimmage and blocking at times. And then again, you have to combat these bigger power slot wide receivers. The slot receivers used to be purely your Julian Edelman's, your Wes Welker's, you know, that, that, that mold of the world. And you still have some guys like that with Cole Beasley and Hunter Renfro, even Jamison Crowder. But now again, you're seeing bigger bodied slot types. You're seeing the Cooper cups. You are seeing Drake London. You are seeing Chris Godwin. You're seeing Tyler Boyd guys that can function in the pass game and run routes, but who also can post you up or who can dig you out in the run game. It's part of the reason why I love Gabriel Davis. Gabriel Davis is a quality wide receiver in the pass, but also in the run. And when you kick 
a quality receiver like that into the slot when you have that power slot option, it adds another layer of unpredictability to your offense because all defenses have to acknowledge, well, you know what? If they run it here, uh, that, that guy in the slot can block. Okay, so I have to keep the run in the back of my mind. What if that slot cracks down and, 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 and we've seen Dawson Knox do this a lot. What happens if that slot receiver cracks down and pushes your edge defender in so that way a tackle or a guard or a center can pull and fold around and lead a play out and get into some space? And now your nickel corner has to take on a pulling offensive lineman. Or even if they just want to keep it simple because they're like, I'm just going to put Mark Andrews in the slot and I'm going to beat up this slot corner every single day and give us the advantage outside the tackle box. Again, if you're vulnerable or deficient against the run, you are a target. If you are vulnerable or deficient in coverage, you are a target. If you're vulnerable or deficient in one of the coverage pieces, man or zone, and the multitude of coverage options that come with that, you are a target. It takes a special level of athlete and a special level of football IQ to play slot corner successfully in today's NFL because it is so demanding. It is a hard position. You are simultaneously a linchpin for coverage and for the run because if you misread, if you misstep, if you mix, mis-execute, whether in the, against the pass or against the run, it's a big play opportunity either way for the offense. You cannot be a deficiency. You cannot be a vulnerability for the defense. And Taron Johnson, time and time again, whether it's coverage, whether it's run, whether it's forcing, spilling, folding in, anything that is asked of him, he does it to such a high level. And it's important, again, because what's asked of him, because slot corner is a premium position in today's NFL, what's asked of him is already very high, just like what's asked of any slot corner in today's NFL. It's a very demanding position. And we didn't even talk about the pieces like how hard it is to play defense in today's NFL with illegal contact and all the rules that come with you. You can't hit a receiver here. You can't touch him here. You can't breathe on him here. You can't look at him this way. All the flags that come because the game is skewed towards the offense, right? Add that on top of it. It's hard. It's hard to cover in the NFL, let alone from the slot, And then add on top of that how important you are to the run game. So much is asked of that position, and that's why it's a premium position in the NFL. I'm going to go back through. I know I didn't grab a lot of comments as I kind of spoke and broke that whole piece down, so I want to go back and break down some comments here before we dive into some more Taron Johnson-specific things. Um, Oh, awesome comment here from Spencer. Spencer saying, this is why Anthony is the best in the biz. Starts from the basics with great explanation and builds us all up to the higher level analysis. I appreciate you, Spencer. Um, I try to aim for that. I don't want to, I don't want to say things that are going over anybody's heads. I, 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 I like to speak in X's and O's and, you know, the jargon and the technical pieces so that we're all on the same page. And I'm very big on that education piece and the understanding piece of it. Cause I think the more you understand, of the game, the more you'll enjoy it. Um, but again, you can't just, you know, come right off rip and start speaking at a 10 when people haven't learned one through nine, because they'll get lost. And that's happened to me before. So I appreciate you recognizing that. Um, and I mean that from the perspective of like, I'm trying to learn. It's like going into a 300 level class when you haven't taken a hundred level or 200 level, and you're just sitting there on day one, like, what are they talking about? They're using all these words that I've never heard. I don't even know what's on, on the screen right now. Yeah. It, uh, you can get lost real quick. So I appreciate you Spencer for recognizing that. And, uh, Shout me out. Thank you very much. Matthew saying, make sure to like and subscribe. Show some love and help the channel. Please, please, and thank you. Everybody that, that's here live, I know we're in the, the slow time of the off season. It's a quick click. Drop a like. Please and thank you. I appreciate you. If you want to tell your family and friends and loved ones about how awesome this show is, that would also be greatly appreciated. Or if you think this show sucks, feel free to tell your enemies and have them watch it because of views of you. I appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome point here from Kevin. Yeah, Taron Johnson is a legend in Buffalo after the pick six uh, to put us in the AFC Championship. People forget about that a lot. Um, I this is I'm not going to get too much on on a tangent and get off, but uh, get off topic too much. But I I think the Baltimore Ravens are being slept on as a team a lot. They were so hurt last year and banged up, and I think Lamar is also a better passer than people give him credit for. And I also think the uniqueness of their running attack. Um, 
is actually like kind of a pro and a good thing as opposed to the big negative that everybody likes to make it out to be because this is a passing league nowadays, yada, yada, and all that. Um, there's more analysis to come for that, but now is not the time. But I think people forget a lot how important that interception was in that game and how the Ravens were, they were playing very good defense. The bills were not, you know, kind of just having their way offensively against the Ravens defense. And that game was very, very, very close throughout the majority of it. Even the finish, you know, it finished 17 to three. Um, But Taron Johnson gets that pick six when it's 10 to three and Baltimore was driving in the red zone. So worst case scenario, even though Tucker had missed some kicks, Baltimore could have made it 10-6 or even potentially tied it and made it 10-10. Instead, you get a 101-yard interception return, and it's 17-3. to um, You know, that not only was that play huge, but I wanted to bring it up in, you know, totality and tying it back to the Baltimore Ravens because I feel like people always go back to that game and like, oh, well, the Bills own the Ravens and this and that. That game was still a lot closer than people think. Also, I still contend – the Indianapolis Colts probably should have beat the Bills um, the round before, which is potentially why Frank Reich and the Colts came out for blood in 2021 uh, in Buffalo and put together one of the best game plans I've ever seen. But I digress. Awesome comment there. Uh, <laughs> comment here from Amy. Appreciate you being here, Amy. Uh, she says, uh, super, oh, I like the little uh, emojis there. She says, super duper tree and Snoopy. New top shelf Buffalo plaque that is there. Um, I wanted to comment on it in last night's film room and great show with Mitch. Um, with cover one. Thank you, Anthony Gobels. I appreciate you, Amy. You're fantastic. Spencer says, Anthony, would you ever consider doing a comparison show between the modern bills and, or the modern bills falling apart and film from like the cold front era or something? Oh, that would actually be really cool. I would. I, you know what I'm always down for? It's hard, especially in the off season to consistently come up with episode topics both in disguise coverage and in the film room so if there's things like that that and this is for you spencer for anybody if there's things that you want covered on this show if there's things you want covered in the film room and you want to see film breakdowns and comparisons and all this stuff anything and everything you guys want get at me on twitter is the best spot again at pro two underscores a n t so pro two underscores ant at me on twitter message me on twitter dm me on twitter or comment in the comments um of this video once it's published comment in the comments of the film room we're always looking for any and every topic suggestion because again selfishly it just makes things easier for us if you guys come to us with things that you want to see it's easier than us having to sit down and go oh what should we cover this week and what do we think people want to hear so if you tell us what you want to hear that's fantastic and i like that idea a lot spencer good thought good thought yeah jason commenting on uh baker mayfield it's funny how the Panthers now have two of the top three picks from the 2018 draft because it was Baker. Baker went one to Cleveland. Saquon went two to the Giants, and Sam Darnold went three to the Jets. So, yeah, the first two QBs off the board, two of the first three now reside in Carolina. Um, we'll see if he works out. I, I've Carolina has a bunch of really good players. Jeremy Chin is one of my top two favorite players in the league, and I also love J.C. Horn and Brian Burns, so I like some of the pieces they have on defense. And they've also got some pieces on offense, like D.J. Moore is sweet. McCaffrey, if he's healthy, is sweet. Um, Robbie Anderson's a deep threat. They just, I don't know if it's Matt Rule or whatever is in the water in Carolina, but they are just, do not seem to be going in the right direction for uh, a variety of reasons. Um, bye bye. Yeah, I um, I'm not a Baker Mayfield fan. I see some other comments um coming through on him. I'm I'm not a Baker Mayfield fan, but I do think last year, like I know a lot of people were dunking on Baker Mayfield, being like, "Oh, I told you guys, like he was terrible." He played with like one arm, like legitimately, like his his non throwing arm, so his left arm, his shoulder, like basically almost like literally got ripped off his body. Like he had to play with a harness to keep that thing in. He could not get full rotation or leverage on throws. Um, and I'm not one of those like a for effort kind of guys, but he grinded and gritted through that season, considering the injury and the pain that he played through. So I tip my cap a little bit to him um, for that. Again, I'm not a Baker Mayfield fan or a Baker Mayfield guy. I don't think he's amazing. Um, but I, you know, I think the effort he showed last year and grinding through that pain and that injury is something to, you know, commend. Um, and again, it doesn't give him a pass. But I think everybody who kind of just dunks on him for his performance last year, you know, you, you have to take that into account because it was uh, uh, 
it, it, it was tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, Howard with some positivity saying this is our year and then saying Bill's Mafia. Oh, oh, that's fair. That's fair. Oh, there's more. I got a whole bunch of comments. It did the thing. The chat every once in a while like jumps me forward. And oh, where do we go here? Steven's question here. Who is better than Johnson as a slot corner or more generally he's top five, right? Yes. 100% Taron Johnson is top five. I think you could also make the case that he's top three. Um, and I think you could make a case that he's arguably the best slot corner in the NFL. I mentioned it earlier. I think, Stephen, before you came in, um, for me, slot corner is really – who the best slot corner is is really dependent on what your scheme is, what your defense is, what you're looking for from your slot corner. I would say that for the Bills, there's no better fit at slot corner than Taron Johnson. Maybe – if not Taron, Taron is number one, but if not Taron, I would take Gardner Johnson from New Orleans because of his length and his physicality combined with his coverage ability. Um, but again, you've got, you know, you've got him, you've got Taron, you've got Mike Hilton, you've got Kenny Moore. I've said it for like the third time now, if we're counting Jalen Ramsey, he's in that conversation for slot corner because he legitimately plays slot in that star role for the Rams defense. Um, but I think Taron Johnson is safely, safely in that top five of slot corners and i think you can make a case for him being top three or even number one um if you want but i think a lot of it is more scheme specific and kind of what you're looking for in a slot corner mm -hmm. oh appreciate you steven steven saying that uh ann is a great teacher like teaching chess because when you get to the point nfl is violent chess uh you really start to enjoy it even more when you get to that point oh awesome comment thank you very much appreciate you Oh, yeah, I forgot this. Awesome comment uh, from, from Karen Johnson from getting hit in the face at the Combine to getting us to the AFC Championship. I forgot. he, uh, Yeah, he got hit in the face with a football, I think, on the um, on that like gauntlet-type drill where the, the defensive backs like from the line, he just gets popped right in the face with a football. It's like really <laughs> – it's really bad. I forgot. Good call. Good call. Ooh, comment here from Handsome Man. A little comparison. The Jim Kelly offense versus the Josh Allen offense. I think that's one to make note of. Very nice. Very nice. Ooh, Connor kind of on that same tip there saying something I just thought of. Similarities and differences between the current Bills and 90s Super Bowl Bills. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a really good one. Ralph saying, how did Taron lose his job to, uh, I believe, Cam Lewis? Good on him to keep it after Lewis got hurt. Taron Johnson was a different player when he first came in. A lot of it stemmed from his, I don't want to say recklessness, but he he's a physical guy. He plays with tenacity, which is part of what allows him to succeed. But he played a little more reckless. He would put himself in situations where he was constantly banged up, which, knock on wood, he's fixed. Um, but he, would, he was always having shoulder injuries and neck injuries because he would just fly in like a heat seeking missile, which is awesome, but he would get hurt a lot and the best ability is availability. Um, so there was that inconsistency in how he approached the game combined with actually like physically being hurt. Um, Oh, awesome comment here from Steven. How come the national media doesn't appreciate slot corners when they do their defense rankings? I don't know. And I also have a similar question in terms of why slot corners are not paid higher. I recognize you can't have like a top tier threshold. Um, for everyone, but they're low. Like if you look at Kenny Moore um, for the Colts is a, a tremendous, especially from a coverage perspective, a tremendous slot corner in the NFL. And the money that he's looking for wasn't that much. And Colts fans were raking him over the coals because and I saw a lot of comments on Twitter. Granted, Twitter's awful, but a lot of comments from people being like, I can't believe he thinks he should get paid like that. And he's holding out. He's only a slot corner. And I'm like, only a slot corner. Like, I just don't think, Stephen, for whatever it is, I don't think the national media and general fans, because of that, you know, in conjunction with that or, you know, correlated to that or because of the, how the national media portrays it, I just don't think there's that value holistically for slot corner amongst fans in the national media. I think part of the reason for it is I think more of the X's and O's community see the value in slot corner and the national media is not X's and O's people. Beat reporters are not X's and O's. Beat reporters are more like, hey, do you like ranch or blue cheese? Instead of being like, hey, question, you know, when you're running a simulated pressure, you know, what are you looking for and doing this and that? Like, 
they're, they're, they're not getting to that level. So national media looks at the game differently. National media receives more coverage and, you know, gets their message out more. And if their message isn't about that X's and O's piece, those things kind of get lost in translation a little bit. Appreciate you, Steven. Yeah. And like Steven says here, the, the money disconnect makes no sense. Yes. They're playing a ton of the snaps. And again, in a high leverage, high profile role at a premium position, I wonder if that'll change as we start to go forward here. Um, you know, in terms of like, you know, like, are we sitting here having this conversation in 10 years going like, Oh, you know, I think slot corner is a premium position. Or is that something that's like easily known? because of where the game is going. Again, a lot of it is where the game is going, what you're what you're asking of, because if you're trying to play more too high coverages and you're playing with light boxes against the run, and again, light boxes, in case anyone doesn't know, that means six defenders or less inside that tackle box, right? So you take the two tackles where they're lined up, and then you go about like two to three, maybe four yards past that, make a little box. That's what the box is. Teams are playing usually with six defenders or less there. So that way they can have more defenders in coverage because they're trying to stop the pass. They're trying to limit explosive plays. They're trying to keep everything in front of them. And when that happens, that means you have guys coming from depth. So much is asked of them to function in a variety of ways. And I just, yeah, I wonder if we'll lose that disconnect as we go forward because teams are playing more too high coverages. Now teams are playing more, you know, light boxes and because of that, there's more stress on those, those positions than ever, you know, as the changing nature of, of defenses. Um, so yeah, I wonder, I wonder, this is a great comment from James. James says in 10 years, the NFL will probably be back to a ground pounding thing. I agree. I think everything, everything in football sports in general, but especially football, everything is cyclical, right? I think as we started to see it a little bit last year with the Colts, the Colts are running this gap scheme run game on offense, and it was destroying teams left and right. The Bills are a primary example of it because defenses aren't built now to stop gap scheme runs. They're designed to stop zone scheme runs, right? They're designed to stop the Shanahan tree of inside, outside, and wide zone. So when teams are coming in running gap and they're running wham and traps at you, defenses are like, what the hell is going on? And so if you've got teams that are built to stop A, you're going to have teams that, okay, you're built to stop A, cool, we're going to do B. And then if enough teams start being successful at doing B, then you're going to start to see more teams do B, and thus we get the cyclical nature. Just like everybody was trying to do you know, the single high, cover three, Legion of Boom, Seattle Seahawks defense, and then everybody started realizing, uh-oh, you really need – Bobby Wagner and Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas and Richard Sherman specifically. And, you know, these are sort of really effective, efficient, one gap penetrating defensive line in order to run this defense successfully. If not, teams are just going to run deep overs and crossers and gash you to death left and right. Now we got to switch and go too high. Everything is very cyclical and connected. But yes, I think in 10 years, we're even seeing it now. More teams are starting to run gap. Think of the runs you saw the Bills be successful with in 2021. Those, those runs where Mitch Morris and Ryan Bates were pulling those gap scheme runs, right? Pin and pulls. So you could see it. Like everything is cyclical. Everything is cyclical. Oh, yeah. Good comment here. The Eagles, too, running a, a physical gap scheme run run attack with Jalen Hurts. Once, once Sirianni realized, hey, Jalen Hurts is a good enough passer, but not to the point where we should just be dropping back to pass every time, but he's a fantastic runner. Let's just run the ball a bunch. And then they started attacking with that gap scheme attack and, you know, hipping their tight ends and forcing defenses to declare. So, yeah, I think you could see that uh, cyclical nature return. And I think you'll see more gap runs as we move forward. And who knows where we'll be in 10 years offensively and defensively. And that's what makes football so fun because the chess match that is going on every off season and NFL coaches are pulling things from the college ranks and, the high school ranks and everything that you're seeing and teams start to pick up things. A lot of, a lot of what you're seeing now, again, we're getting off topic, but a lot of what you're seeing now in defenses, NFL defenses, how they're defending spread offenses and how they're defending the pass is coming from what college defenses have done. If you look at things like the tight front that Brandon Staley, you know, is, is employing and, you know, you see what Vic Fangio has done, that whole like coaching tree. And then you look at a lot of college teams that have played it successfully, you know, there's, I don't want to get too down the rabbit hole, but there's, you know, connections with, you know, three man defensive lines and all this stuff. Everything is very cyclical and it's all connected. So 
you know, we've gotten horribly off topic, but that's, that's what part of the fun of a live show because you guys are so interactive and so fantastic. And I'm going to switch the banner to say high level of execution and functionality, because now we're going to dive into some more Taryn Johnson specific things as I take a drink of water here. So amongst all corners, so this isn't just slot corners that I'm about to give you some stats for, right? Of all corners outside, slot, whatever have you, of all corners with at least 20% of coverage snaps in the 2021 regular season plus playoffs, okay? 129 corners saw at least 20% of coverage snaps. So keep that in the back of your mind. Everything I'm telling you is out of 129, okay? <laughs> Taron Johnson had the 23rd lowest reception percentage at 56.8. He had the 30th lowest passer rating when targeted at 79.5. He was 18th in snaps per reception. All three of those things are wild, right? So 23rd lowest reception percentage. It's easy to give up completions when the man you're covering is like an arm's length away from the quarterback. And he had the 23rd lowest. 30th lowest passer rating when targeted. Again, he plays a position where the people he's covering, it's usually easier to get a bucket if you're a slot corner, then it is to get an out. Then it is to get if you're an outside receiver. 18th in snaps per reception at 13. So he was 18th amongst all corners in how many snaps he played without giving up a catch. Again, unreal for someone who plays near the center of the field. And then if you look at from a tackling perspective on pass plays, he was eighth in stops. Uh, for PFF. I love this metric. So a stop um, constitutes a quote unquote win for the defense or conversely a quote unquote loss for the offense. PFF describes a stop as an offensive gain on first down that is kept to less than 40% of the line to gain, less than 50% of the line to gain on second down, and any third or fourth down play kept without a first down or a touchdown. Long story short, think of a stop as making a tackle that matters, not just one that fills up the stat sheet. Think of think of a stop like on um, third and four, making a tackle for a two-yard gain and forcing fourth and four is so much better than making a tackle 10 yards down the field. And it's a first down for the offense. They're both tackles. They both count in the stat sheet as a tackle, but one is so much better, and that's where stops come in. Then you want to look at some coverage-specific metrics, right? So man coverage, 17th in reception percentage allowed amongst 129 qualifying corners in man coverage, 17th in reception percentage of 45.8. And then in man, he had the seventh most snaps per reception at 16.5. Then in zone, he was 40th in reception percentage at 63.8, which is still, you might see that and be like, oh, he fell a little more in zone. I thought he was good in zone. What's tough in this area You'll get dinged the closer you are towards the center of the field as a defender in zone coverage because those those checkdowns and those dump downs to running backs, tight ends, or anybody over the middle, like even if that's not your guy, the closest defender will get dinged for a reception. So say Taron Johnson's on the right side of the field, dropping into his, into his zone, and someone from the left side of the field runs a drag, you know, comes under on that drag route, but Milano took a running back and went to the left. And so he's in the flat. Tremaine Edmonds is carrying a, a slot receiver vertically up the field. So there's nobody in the center. If they complete that completion to that under route and Taron Johnson's the closest defender, even though it's technically not his man, he gets dinged for that reception, right? So even the fact that he's 40th is still very good. And then he was tied for 12th in stops on pass play tackling in zone. So eighth in stops on pass play tackling overall coverage. And then 12th um, in zone speaks to, again, him finding his area, getting to his spot, coming up and making plays. This is part of, you know, the highlight piece I want to give for Taron Johnson is, again, it's not just that he plays a premium position. It's that he plays a premium position and he executes at a high level and he has a high level of functionality. And when I say, as I drop my pen, as I, when I say functionality, I mean his ability to cover and his ability to function in the run. So now those, those metrics that I gave you, right. Were amongst all corners again, with the 20% of coverage snaps, so 129 corners. Now let's just focus on slot corners. So let's narrow down that, 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 that scope a little bit. So if you take corners with just 20% 
of the slot coverage snaps. So basically the slot corners in the NFL, you get 41. So roughly say, think about it, say 41 slot corners in the NFL who had qualifying snaps. So these metrics are specifically for slot coverage snaps. And, you know, to put it in perspective for Taron Johnson, uh, last year he had 641 coverage snaps. In 2021, 539 of them came in the slot. And those 539 slot snaps were the second most slot snaps in the entire NFL behind Mike Hilton for Cincinnati. Mike Hilton had 585, and he played two more games than Taron Johnson because he had the AFC Championship and he had the Super Bowl. So amongst those 41 slot corners, Taron Johnson, sixth in snaps per reception, tied for 10th in the lowest passer rating against, eighth in terms, or eighth lowest yards per coverage snap. And also he was targeted the fifth most. So he has plenty of sample size in terms of being tested. So the fact that he was targeted the fifth most and then was sixth in snaps per reception, he wasn't getting burned a ton. He wasn't getting beat. And then, Let's talk about another aspect that I've highlighted a little bit and I want to, you know, we're going to talk about it holistically, but I wanted to bring some metrics again to tie it in together. Cause my favorite piece of Taron Johnson is what he does in fitting the run. So of all corners with at least 20% of run defense snaps in 2021, again, not just slot, all corners, 20% of run defense snaps in 2021, 121 corners qualified. So keep that number in mind. Every ranking I'm giving you now is out of 121. He was fourth in stops. Again, stops are tackles that matter, not just ones to fill up the stat sheet. So a stop, third and four, you make a tackle for one or two or three or a loss. It prevents them getting a first down. That's a stop. That's so much more valuable than making a a tackle 10 yards downfield on third and fourth. They both count as tackles. One is a stop. One is much better. Fourth in stops with 14 against the run. Twelfth in stop percentage tied for 18th in average depth of tackle. And you may hear like, Oh, 18th. That's uh, you know, that's out of 41. That's not crazy. It's because some guys just, they had less tackles, but they had enough sample size to qualify for the metric. And they were more towards like one and zero. The important thing is the number, his average depth of tackle on run defense snaps is 2.8. That means his average depth of tackle is 2.8 yards past the line of scrimmage. That's phenomenal. That means he's processing as fast He's processing accurately, and then when he's coming forward, he's executing with technique and form because it's not enough just to read what's going on in front of you. It's not enough to read it correctly and read it with speed. You also have to execute when you get there. There's so many things that are tied into playing the run. If you don't read run, doesn't matter. You're out. If you don't read it fast enough, doesn't matter. You're out. If you read it fast enough and you read it right, but you come through and you can't tackle for crap, you're out. So he's doing all three of those things regularly to be fourth in stops, 12th in stop percentage, and have an average depth of tackle of 2.8. And then amongst those 121 corners that played at least 20% of run defense snaps in 2021, he was fifth in total tackles. Taron Johnson's ability to play coming forward is huge for the Buffalo Bills defense. And this is really where that high-level execution and functionality comes in because I wanted to put the metrics into perspective so you guys could see just how good he is in coverage overall, good in man, good in zone, and what he does statistically from an advanced metric perspective coming forward against the run. And then you put on the tape and just what he does, he, he plays the run legitimately like a linebacker. Like he has no idea that he's 5'11", 192 pounds. He plays in coverage. He plays like he's 5'11", 192 pounds. He's fluid. He's athletic. You see the technique. When he comes forward, oof. Like he, so again, he plays coverage like he's 5'11", 192 pounds. When he comes forward and plays the run, he plays it like he's 6'2", 230. With his mentality, with his physicality, he comes forward with bad intentions, man. Like I, I put a tweet out yesterday and you just see it's one of my, 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 my favorite things, you know, click, close, detonate. So you see what's going on. You click, you close down fast, and then you detonate on the ball carrier or receiver trying to make a catch. He does those things so well, so often. And it's so important for this Buffalo Bills defense because of what is at, oh, this is, this is perfect. This is right where I'm going. Uh, Jason says, uh, so does Johnson's pro does Johnson process the play better than Tremaine Edmonds? Or is that an unfair comparison? 
Oh, also great comment here from Amy saying, go order some one pie pizza tonight for a midnight snack. Yeah, you should. Oh man, it will be an amazing midnight snack. One pie pizza is the best, truly. This is also part of what makes Taron Johnson so important, right? So the, the, the role that Edmonds, and maybe we'll see it differently this year with the addition of Daquan Jones and what the Bills have done up front on the defensive line, but Tremaine Edmonds a lot of times gets put into two gapping scenarios, which means by design, offensive linemen are getting to the second level. Tremaine Edmonds has to make contact with them and he's put in a two gapping situation means like he has to defend like this gap here and this gap here. So he's got to grab his man. He's got to extend. He's got to read and he's got to make a play. A lot of those situations are lose, lose situations because if you don't read it right. And if you don't play it right, if you try to get underneath and go this way, okay, you just opened up the alley for the running back to go this way. If you try to go this way, they can go that way. Like you're kind of damned if you do damned, if you don't at times. He gets put in those situations a lot because the Bills defensive line is a one gap penetrating defensive line. So sometimes naturally they can get themselves, you know, kind of put out of the play or if they guess wrong or they hit the wrong gap, they get taken out of the play. You add in Matt Milano, who is a dog and a disruptor around the line of scrimmage. Truly, he is trying to time snap counts and he is penetrating gaps and he is causing chaos for others to clean up, right? So they, Milano is more disruptor than Edmonds. Edmonds, because he has the two gap, is also taking on blockers and taking on responsibility. Taron Johnson, a lot of times, has the opportunity, if he reads and processes correctly, to be that cleanup guy. So that's the part I want to talk about now. And then in relation to processing better than Edmonds, I would say he processes better than Tremaine Edmonds. But I will say... A lot of the things that people ding Edmonds for when it comes to like, oh, he's processing too slow. A lot of it is tied to what is being asked of him. It's very, even, even, even for me, like, and I don't even want to say even for me, like I know so much or I'm super knowledgeable, but like, I know this game pretty well and I study my ass off and I I watch a ton of film to try and be able to tell what everyone is doing on this play. In order to do that, you have to connect a lot of dots. And even with that, there's still so much that is unknown right? Even for me, for anyone, let alone like the less you do, right? If you're not watching all 22 and you're not watching it a bunch, if you're just watching one game broadcast footage on CBS on one o'clock or at one o'clock on a Sunday, and you just watch that game one time, and then you're sitting there being like, oh man, like Edmonds doesn't process well. That's, that's really like an unfair thing. There's There's no way to know what's being asked of a player without knowing the defensive call and thus knowing the responsibility that comes after it. So a lot of it, even for me, even though I think, you know, and several of us at cover one when we grind the tape and then collaborate and really try to pinpoint everything that's going on. Even within that, there's still so much variability and still so much that's unknown. I think Edmonds gets a bad rap at times for doing his job, but him doing his job makes it seem like he's not doing what fans want him to do. Um, I will say that Edmonds needs work with his processing. I've maintained that all along, and I do think Taron Johnson is a better processor than Tremaine Edmonds, but I think Edmonds is a better processor than people think. I think Taron Johnson being a better processor than Edmonds is more of a kudos to Taron Johnson than it is a knock against Tremaine Edmonds. I think Edmonds gets put in a lot of disadvantageous disadvantageous positions where a lot is asked of him and he's put into these lose, lose kind of roles. And he has to be at an unreal level um, in order to kind of, you know, make a play that fans want in order to those splash plays. Right. Cause we've seen there and there's clips that exist and they're not few and far between when he's allowed to play free and clean. And all he has to do is just read and react. He's making sideline to sideline plays and big hits. Um, then you factor in what he does in coverage as well. His coverage processing is also tremendous in addition to the physical piece. So I would put Taron Johnson ahead of Tremaine Edmonds, but it's more of a kudos and feather in the cap to Taron than it is a knock um, on Tremaine Edmonds. But very good question, um, even though it is. I, I, and I don't think it's too unfair because um, you're just talking about processing overall. They process differently, and they have different things to process. But I think that's a fair question. Really good question. And again, so tying in, I, I want to bring up that comment about Tremaine Edmonds because again, Taron Johnson, he has to execute when he comes forward in the run. He's not just making tackles on like quick screens and bubble screens and, you know, swing passes to the running back. He's making legitimate tackles in the run game. Like he's lined up in the slot and on the snap, he's sitting there in a catch technique and he's sitting there wait, oh, and catch technique. If anybody doesn't know, that's more just like, Imagine like you're catching 
quote unquote, the receiver in front of you. So instead of on the snap, you're backpedaling, you're kind of buzzing your feet. So your feet are moving, but you're more, you're not backing up. You're in closer to like a stationary position. And then the receiver gets near you. And based on what the coverage is and based on what you're doing, you get hands on the receiver and you kind of make contact and catch them. Like you don't walk out, you don't get full. You kind of like catch, stay bent with your elbows and kind of catch that receiver and guide them to where you want in your coverage and in their route and take things away from you. Um, just, I wanted to mention that since I said it, but he's sitting there in that catch technique, reading his man, but also reading the play. And so he's got his coverage responsibility, but then he sees run bang and he gets forward and he knifes into the backfield on first and 10 and he makes a tackle. And now it's second and nine, second and eight or second and seven. That happens a lot. Again, he's got that average depth of tackle at 2.8. He functions in the run game like a linebacker, which in a defense that is primarily a nickel defense, that means two things. That means one, your personnel in terms of like weight is lighter personnel. That means you've only got four defensive linemen. You've only got two linebackers. So your heavier guys, you've only got six and then you've got five defensive backs. So you're lighter in terms of personnel added on top of that. If you're a nickel defense, probably means you're playing with a light box as well. That not always, you know, Taron Johnson will line up in the box. He will be that seventh defender in the box, or you could play single high safety and you can bring down Jordan Poyer or bring down Micah Hyde, either pre-snap or post-snap and have, you know, that seventh defender in the box if you need to, but you're having light boxes in terms of numbers and you're having light boxes in terms of personnel, which means the closest people to the line of scrimmage, Taron Johnson or a safety coming down, you have to execute in the run, which is part of what makes Mike Hyde and Jordan Poyer so great because when they do come down, whether they're lined up in in or around the box pre-snapping and stay there and function, or they're lined up in split safety looks and spin down and make a play, when you come down because you are that seventh defender, you are usually that guy that has to make the tackle in the alley or you 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 have a pivotal role. You're either forced the spill or the guy who's making the tackle in the alley or sometimes folded in from the backside making a play. There's a lot that is asked of you, right? And you have to execute at a high level. And then for Taron Johnson, again, what the Bills love to do, what's the name of this show? Disguise coverage. What the Bills like to do in disguising coverage is having those two high safety, those split safety shells pre-snap and then staying in them. Or right before the snap happens, spinning one down into a into a single high safety look. Or after the snap, spinning into a single high safety look. If you are lined up with a two high split safety shell pre-snap, there is a multitude of coverages that you can, even if you just stay in two, two high coverages, right? You got cover two zone, cover two man, you got quarters or cover four, you got cover six. You can play match coverage and pattern match out of that as well versus if you're in single high you're looking at cover one, cover three. I don't want to simplify it too much, but you've got more too high coverage personnel or two, you've got more too high coverage options baked into a too high look than you do a single high look. And then when you can come from depth, there's so much you can do in terms of playing games and showing a quarterback this look, and then he snaps the ball and it's something completely different, right? Or right before he's about to snap it, if you can time that snap and then you shift your coverage and shift what you're doing, everything that he thought he was just reading is completely changed, right? So the Bills' ability to do that with their safeties partially stems from what Taron Johnson can do because the safeties don't have to always come down. They don't have to always be that seventh defender. They don't always have to be around the box. They don't have to be that alley player, that force player, that spill player, or fold back in. They don't have to be that guy. They don't have to always you know, watch out for that deep over, things in the middle, or things in that, you know, kind of middle third area or middle quarter of the field on the hashes because of what Taron Johnson can do. They can shift and roll coverages in other ways. More, more of the menu is available to the Buffalo Bills defense because of what Taron Johnson does and how he function in, it functions in his role in both coverage and against the run. Because he is not a liability in either of those aspects. Because he can cover man, because he can cover zone, and all the coverages that come within both of those. Because he can also function against the run and come forward and be physical and tenacious and make plays, he affords the Buffalo Bills defense a multitude of potential and a multitude of opportunities. He is a rock, paper, scissors type of defender. He allows the opportunity for your defense to throw rock, throw paper, and throw scissor. He affords you 
that opportunity because of what he can do. It's nice. You know, if you got a team like the New England Patriots and they want to go two running backs and two tight ends, they want to go 22 personnel and they're all huge. It's like, you know what? Okay, cool. Let's put in AJ Klein. Or this year, maybe it's like, okay, let's put in Terrell Bernard for some snaps. But those opportunities are few and far between. A lot of times teams are running the ball out of 11 personnel or 10 personnel. So three wide receiver sets, four wide receiver sets, and anything and everything in between. But they like to stick to those. Again, it's a passing league. But teams will run out of that. Taron Johnson, because of his coverage functionality, because of his run game and run fit functionality, combined with his high level of execution in all of those facets and areas, allows for the Bills to stay fluid no matter what team they are playing for the most part. They are not... Their hand is not forced. Offenses cannot dictate to the Buffalo Bills defense because of what Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer do. We talk about that all the time, but also because of what Taron Johnson does and what Taron Johnson is. And that's this whole picture of why Taron Johnson is indispensable and tremendously important to the Buffalo Bills defense because he plays this high-priority premium position, and he plays it at a high level. He executes at a high level. He functions at a high level. And... He's so smart. There's so many training camp clips and practice clips where you hear him talking ball. And if you watch the film, I put a lot of them out on Twitter, his pre-snap communication. He's calling out things. It's not just him being like, oh, what are we doing, Micah? Oh, okay, got it. And understanding it, which he does. It's also him reading what's going on and him communicating to Tremaine Edmonds or communicating to Matt Milano or communicating to his outside corner, communicating to the safeties. He is in that two-way go island scenario. If he gets beat or if he's a vulnerability, that is a negative domino effect for the entire rest of the defense. So he has to be on point with everyone else. The linebackers, the outside corners, and the safeties need to know where Taron Johnson is going to be and what he's going to do. He has to. Everyone has to do their job on every snap, but his job is tremendously important because if he fails, he's one of those buttresses in the dam where if he goes down, the dam doesn't completely break, but there's a huge hole and there's tons of water coming in. And that's a big problem. And more often than not, he's just standing tall and that dam stays up and that water does not come in. And that's why he has that high level of execution and functionality. And ooh, ooh, good comment here from Jason. Jason says, when Bean gave Taryn that contract extension, I was on the fence with him, no longer on the fence like that, Jason. And even that, you know, to go back to the contract talk that we were talking about earlier, Taryn Johnson, I am very comfortable saying he's one of the top five slot corners in the league. I would also put him in the top three. I think he's in that Rolodex. He had a three-year, $24 million extension. I know we're all like, we're all like knocking that as if that's like, I'm I'm about to say like, you know, he's underpaid and he's making freaking $24 million. But given how important he is, that's a tremendous deal. The money, the return on investment you get with the position that he plays and the high level at which he plays it at, Three years, $24 million is nothing. He's so important to this defense because of, again, the position that he plays and what is asked of slot corners in today's NFL. And on top of that, how he executes in that role because of what he does in coverage. And again, cannot be understated what he cannot be overstated. I should say cannot be overstated what he does in the run. He has to fit the run like a linebacker regularly because of his proximity to the line of scrimmage and his proximity to the quarterback and everything that goes on. So oof, just a premium player at a premium position. And I get it. There's a lot of other sexy names on this bill's defense. You've got Von Miller, who's one of the best edge rushers in football. You've got and a, and a, and a legitimate hall of famer. You've got Tredavious white. Who's one of the best corners in the NFL. You've got the best safety tandem in the entire NFL and arguably, you know, individually the best safeties in the NFL. They're in that role the next two. You've got Matt Milano, who I think is tremendous. I think he's arguably not, not, I don't want to say the best, but he's top five coverage linebackers in the league. Um, He's tremendous. You've got Tremaine Edmonds, who's a lightning rod for criticism and positivity at the same time. You've got Ed Oliver, who still has not yet hit his ceiling and has all this potential. You've got Gregory Rousseau, who has, you know, the size and the measurables and all this potential. There's a reason why all these guys, you know, kind of overshadow Taron Johnson. But in terms of importance, man, he's right there with 
the Micah Hydes and the Jordan Poyers and the Tredavious Whites in terms of we're not just for from the secondary, like in terms of what they mean to this defense and how important they are in this defense. Slot corner is a premium position in today's NFL. Taron Johnson is a premium level player at a premium position in today's NFL. Executes at a high level, does his job, and then some, right? He does his 111th and goes above and beyond at the same time. Tremendous player, tremendous player. And that was really the focus of tonight's episode. And I'm going to throw up that banner there. Ooh, question here from Matthew saying, have you guys done a show on if Poyer should be paid by the Bills or move on from him? I think it, I don't think you're going to get anybody who's going to say the Bills should move on from Jordan Poyer. I think Jordan Poyer needs to be retained. It all just comes down to, what his contract is. I believe right now, after the Micah Fitzpatrick extension, Jordan Poyer is like the 13th highest paid safety in the NFL. That's atrocious. His numbers last year scream that he was arguably the best safety in all of football. Um, he had a crazy unreal 2021. And I think it's no coincidence that since he and Micah Hyde have been on this Bills team, every year they've gotten better and this Bills defense has gotten better. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario. Um, but I'll speak for myself here. I, I, I want Jordan Poyer capped. It just comes down to what kind of money he's asking for uh, between him and his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, who Rosenhaus is, and I mean this in a good way for the players and for Rosenhaus, Rosenhaus is a shark, um, big time power agent, um, gets his kind, gets his clients, you know, what they want in one way or another. So it just comes down to the money and seeing if you can make it work. And, you know, the salary cap is going to be going up, but I don't think there's anybody who thinks that, oh, well, pff, you know, he should be gone. It's just going to be, you know, your question there, if Poyer should be paid by the bills, it's going to be dependent upon what you define paid as 10 million a year, 12 million a year, 13 million a year, 14 million, million a year, higher, lower, anything like that, give or take. Um, it really comes down to what he's looking to get paid. And until we know that ballpark number, you know, I, I don't think there's, you know, kind of the point to the conversation as of this point, but I think he needs to be retained. He's tremendously, tremendously important. Good question, Matthew. Well done, Matthew. Matthew, you've been killing it these last two nights. You had a bunch of good stuff last night and you were giving support to Mitch Morris. And then you joined me here for disguise coverage Had a bunch of good things to say. So thank you, Matthew. And thank you to everybody on this show for joining me and riding with me live here on this episode of disguise coverage. I know again, it's the slow times. It's July 6th. We've got another like three weeks of, you know, malaise and molasses a little bit until we get to training camp that kicks off. And then, you know, then it's all hands on deck. We got training camp coverage and preseason coverage. And then before you know what the regular season's here, it's again, July 26th. We'll be at Bill's open practice, July 24th. We're 18 days away from training camp. We're about a month away from preseason action. And then the bills open up Thursday, September 8th in Los Angeles against the Rams. It's July 6th right now. We're basically two months away from the start of the regular season. But I know how this time can be, you know, a drag and, you know, kind of like a slog to kind of get through everything. So I appreciate everybody joining me live on this episode. It would be really sad and boring and weird if I was just here by myself talking to myself. So I appreciate all of you joining me here and ride with me and your questions, thoughts, comments, concerns for me, for each other just the back and forth engagement um, and energy and activity. I love it. And the entire team at cover one appreciates it. So thank you very much to everyone who wrote with me live on the episode tonight, all the kind words, questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, all of it. Thank you very much. If you did not ride with me live on this episode, that is also okay. Thank you very much for your listen, your view, your download, whatever have you. If you are still here live, if you are watching later, listening later on Spotify or Apple or any other platform, please on YouTube, drop a like, subscribe to Disguise Coverage. If you are listening on Spotify or Apple, whatever have you, please drop a review. Please give a rating. Please subscribe to Disguise Coverage on the podcasting apps or platforms that you choose to experience this show on. Take a look at everything from Cover One as a whole. Subscribe to the Cover One Network. We got you covered every single day of the week when it comes to Buffalo Bills coverage. We also have a lot of great teaching things planned as we get towards training camp from myself and Eric Turner and uh, Kendall Mursky, we have a bit of a cover one glossary and or playbook kind of have a working title going on right now. We're putting together, you know, educational videos to kind of teach about, 
football in general, using the Bills as an example to really further that X's and O's and educational piece that we really pride ourselves on here at Cover One. So there's a lot in the works. But thank you very much for anybody, your listen, your view, your download, whatever have you. I see a lot of uh, positive comments coming through uh, in on the chat. And, you know, I feel corny bringing them up sometimes. I already brought up a lot of positive things you guys said about me earlier. I feel corny doing it again. But know that I see them and I, uh, I, I, I truly appreciate them. So thank you very much for all the kind words, the view, the listen, the download. Please rate and review and subscribe. Please drop a like. Get yourself some one pie pizza. I know Wednesday night is almost over. You got Thursday tomorrow. Then you got Friday. It's been, you know, a holiday week for some or for most. Close it out strong with some delicious one pie pizza. I hope you and your family and friends and loved ones take care of one another and are all doing safe and doing well are all being safe and doing well. Yikes. Take care of one another. Be kind to one another. I will see you next week for another episode of Disguise Coverage. And until then, take care. I'll see you next week.